In this video, I'm going to give a quick overview of Log4j, and I'm going to show how to implement it in a simple Java program in IntelliJ IDEA. So first of all, why do we want Log4j? Why can't we just use System Out Printline? Well, System Out Printline just kind of puts stuff somewhere, where logging has the concept of levels. And these levels can be very important because we can use them to filter our logs. So some logs are more important than others. Also, system out print line tends to go to one place where proper logging can send our log messages to multiple places if we want, maybe to a file, to a database, to an email, into a console, and many other places as well. The reality is whoever really looks at system out print line, it ends up mixed up with a bunch of other stuff. When I tend to see system out print line used, I tend to see it used by people who just don't understand how to use a debugger. And in that case, I recommend using a debugger. So the logging levels are very important because it's an indication of severity. So we have a couple of a couple special log levels here. We have off, which means don't show anything, and all, which means show everything. In between those two, we have kind of a descending list of severity. So if we log something at fatal, that means our program is crashing or is about to crash or something really bad is happening. Error is an exception was thrown. Maybe we could recover from it. Maybe we couldn't. Warn is just something feels off, kind of like an array of length zero where we're expecting some data. We want to say, ah, oh, that doesn't feel right. Info is just normal. Okay, I'm starting to read a file now. I'm writing to a database. And then debug and trace are both kind of fine-grained things that we tend to use early on when we're deploying software. And I'll say that these logging levels really come in handy when we're trying to debug. For part of my career, I was implementing point-of-sale systems at retailers. And there was one particular retailer in Mexico where I worked and they were running on a very limited hardware profile in their stores. And a lot of my job was trying to figure out why we were getting defects. And it was tricky because this is a high volume cash register. And I'm trying to figure out why something happened two days ago when I wasn't even there. So what I would typically do is take the logs and I would filter it by severity level to at least give me a clue. And then I could keep digging and put together a hypothesis on why something happened. And then hopefully roll out a fix or close the issue if it was something that felt like a one-off. So that was really handy at that point. And at that point, we were using text files for logging. But nowadays, there are a lot of log aggregators that will aggregate logs across multiple sources, which is really important with microservices because a customer's single journey through our application could hit a series of microservices that are not necessarily connected, at least uh, maybe connected by a correlation ID, but not necessarily co connected by that, especially if it's a scaled microservice where there could be multiple instances running. So the ability to create these logs and to place them in different places and then aggregate them together later by a correlation ID or filter them by the severity level will really, really save us time when we do what, frankly, we do a lot of as developers, and that is production support. So uh, understanding Log4j, Log4j really has two major concepts. Loggers are things that gather logs and code, uh, so we can reference a logger when we want to make a log statement. And then appenders take those log messages and publish them somewhere. And what's neat is that loggers can subscribe to multiple appenders. So uh, if we have a case where we want to write to a file, but we also want to alert for a fatal, uh, maybe we alert by sending a text message, we could use an appender to do that. And we can filter the log levels both on the logger and on the appender. So first of all, we need a bit of configuration. Uh, we need to set up our POM XML with this dependency. Of course, at the time you're watching this video, the latest version might be different. So I encourage you to go out and grab the latest version. So I navigate to my POM XML and I jump in the dependencies and you see that I've set this dependency here. I already synced it to save us a bit of time, but basically we just add that dependency to the dependency section in our POM XML. Now, there's a configuration file called log4j2.xml, and I wanted to paste it in here, but actually it, it ended up getting too big, and then it, it kind of squished down the font. So I'm just going to do this one live. As long as we put it in the right place and name it the right name, log4j will be able to find this automatically. So I start by going to source and then main and then resources. Right-click, and I say new file and log4j2.xml. Again, that file name is very important. 
and then I'm going to just paste in a pre-configured log for j configuration that I have. At the top we have a property with the name layout which sets the layout of our logging messages so it gives them a standard look and feel. So d is date, t is time, and then we have our level, and then we have the logger that's producing this message, and then we have the message that came from the program and a uh, line separator for this operating system. Now Log4j is an Apache project so you see uh, you can simply navigate here and it has a description of all the different options that you have for this layout. Now after that we have our appenders and remember that our appenders are things that will publish the log files somewhere. So I've set a couple up here. One is console, just our normal console like we'll see down here in IntelliJ IDEA when I expand this up. And then also a file. And you see that the file has a pattern layout as well, so we can get a little more granular there on that file. Now, we can have multiple loggers. The default logger is often considered the root logger, but we can make additional loggers as well. And you see that here I made a logger, logger called vehicles. And we also know that logger can publish to multiple appenders, which is how we get uh, log messages that can go to a console, go to a file database, and even trigger a text message all simultaneously from the same logger. So you see here, I'm referring to log file, which is a file where I'm going to be appending these log messages, and then also console up here, which just writes to our standard system out. Now in the log file, you'll note that I'm referencing a file called app.log, and that's the file where our logs are going to go. So, you know, I just have it sitting out kind of at um, root level right now, but you know, ideally we might put that on an absolute path or even send it to a special computer uh, that's just going to have our log files. We could log to a different computer if we want, log to a database, anything like that. But for simplicity, I'm simply having it log to a file called app.log. Next, we need to publish to the log from our code. So first of all, we're going to use one of these logger messages here to instantiate our logger. And then we can use logger dot in the different severity level to send a log message. So you remember the severity levels, uh, really the ones that are important here are fatal, error, warn, info, debug, and trace. And you see in my example, I have info and error. The other ones I mentioned also exist, debug, trace, uh, fatal, warn, so on and so forth. So the first thing we need to do is set up this logger variable uh, when we're starting, when we're at the very top of our class, either when we're instantiating an object or very early on in construction of that class so that we can use the logger. After that, we need to insert these log messages wherever we think they're appropriate, and very important, do it at the correct logging level. Uh, sometimes I've seen junior programmers who log everything at error level, even just normal stuff. It's like, no, stop, stop. You know, when you're looking at a log that was generated over two minutes and could easily be 30 megabytes worth of information, the ability to search by just error is very important. And if you're logging everything at error, that's going to slow you down significantly. So understanding those levels is crucial. So back to our program, and I'm going to go to an inventory reader class that I made previously. And at the top, I'm going to add that statement to initialize our logger. Notice I just kind of put it up here. Uh, this is going to be called shortly after the constructor for this class is called, if that's called. Uh, but nonetheless, because I'm declaring it as an attribute, and good idea to make it private, but since I'm declaring it as an attribute, that means that all of my methods have access to this uh, attribute called logger. So we go to create vehicle, and let's go ahead and say logger.info, and we'll say just a simple message reading vehicles. Then let's go ahead and repeat this down at the end of the method and we'll say finished reading vehicles. Now we have an interesting scenario here which is we have a catch block. And a best practice with exceptions is you should always log in a catch block even if you don't think you have to. There again that's where going back after the fact and tracing back is really valuable. When you have these nuggets we understand what was happening in the exception. So for this we can try a different logging level. We'll want to do it before we throw it. Log this one at error. Now let's run our program and I anticipate that we're going to see a new file created called app.log and I anticipate that we'll also see a bit of output uh, in the console as we run our program. So um, I'll tell you what, why don't I go ahead and debug it and watch those one at a time. So snap a breakpoint here and then we will debug.
Now note I've already stepped over that logger.info. Note in IntelliJ, if I go to console, you'll see info, vehicles, reading vehicles. You'll also see uh, the timestamp and the thread, just as that format told us it would. But notice the important thing is it's telling us the severity level right here. So I'll go ahead and uh, go through this, and I'll tell you what, I'm going to snap another breakpoint uh, right in my other two log messages. I do not anticipate log.error to be invoked just yet, uh, because I, it should read this file cleanly. Uh, so we shouldn't see that invoked, but we should see the last one invoked. So I continue. And looks like I went a little too fast there, but nonetheless, you notice that we have our other info statement in the logger. And let's take a look at app.log, and sure enough, this is the destination of our other appender, and it has similar messages. So go back to Inventory Reader, and I finish. Now, I did say that appenders can have different severity levels. So let's try this. I'm going to say for the console, only show me errors, but for the file, show me everything. So I go back to log4j uh, 2xml and I simply go to the appender that I want to change and I add this line level range filter min level error max level error which means it's only going to see error messages. Of course I could adjust that to get more messages but let's say we just want to see error messages here. On match is accept so if it's an error we'll go ahead and use it. On mismatch equals deny. Let's run our program one more time and what I anticipate now is that we won't get these info messages in the console. However, we will still get them in our app.log. Now it's going to append to app.log, so you notice it has the old log statements here. But let's watch what happens when we go ahead and run this with the updated filter on our appender. So you see we got the two new info messages in our app.log. Now let's scroll up on the console, and you see sure enough, we did not receive the error message in the console. So that's how log4j can effectively filter logs and send them only to the right destination. Uh, another way that I used this when I was working in point of sale is we did exactly this. We had one file that would have all of the log information and then a console that would only show errors or we could have that in a file that only shows errors. When someone told me that a point of sale device had crashed at maybe uh, 1 p.m. the previous day, a lot of times the first thing I would do is go to the file that just has the errors to try to see what was happening at that point. And once I start to come up with a hypothesis, then I'd go to the more detailed log file to see exactly what steps were taken to get to that error. little tricky work, but it was kind of fun too. So, okay, now we need to test our theory out though. Will we still see errors in the console and will we see everything in our app.log? Well, for that, I can essentially force an exception to happen. I'm going to give this file that we're reading an invalid name. And what I anticipate will happen then is it's going to catch it down here in this catch block, and that's going to give us our error message. Let's go ahead and run this in debug mode so we can watch that happen. Okay, I anticipate this will throw an exception. I'm going to choose step over, which if everything worked properly would go to the next line to execute. But if there is an exception, this will jump right to the catch block. And sure enough, here's our catch block. And you notice that we have an exception. It says no such file, inventory2.txt. So we log it. Let's go to our console. Look at that. There's our error in the console. No info lines, but we still have an error. Log4j, uh, sorry, app.log. Uh, and again, remember, it's going to keep appending to this file each time we run. So we have our initial info. And now we have an error message. We go back, and uh, it's going to throw this runtime exception, which is interesting because it's going to skip line 63, and it gives us a bit more information on the console. So what you see here is we typically had a reading vehicles, finish reading vehicles, reading vehicles, finish reading vehicles. Now we have reading vehicles, and we have error here. Uh, so it didn't get to the finished reading vehicles because there was an exception thrown. And it looks like it could probably be a little bit more verbose in what we're throwing here. Uh, I should have said e.get message. I think I tried to and might have typed over myself. Uh, but nonetheless, we do see now that we're able to log at different levels and we're able to configure our appenders to listen to certain levels of logging information. So this is absolutely critical to production support. It's not the thing we tend to think of in 
backlog refinement or sprint planning, but it's definitely something that is going to come in very handy, especially in today's world where we have mobile apps where there's hardware we don't even own and we want to find some things out about it. And that concept I mentioned about microservices and correlation IDs. So I would put this pretty high on the list of must have skills for a good developer. And I hope this video helped you get there. And as always, I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you.